While Hollywood spent the 1950s fantasizing about computers of the future, scientists and engineers were inventing them. Hello and welcome to the journey inside the computer. Now when this film was released, modern computers were in their infancy, but humans had been building calculating machines for thousands of years. It may surprise you to know that Stonehenge was probably a giant astronomical calculator. Here's one of the first portable calculators. It was invented about 5,000 years ago. It could add and subtract and didn't require batteries. So ingenious, the abacus is still in use today. Later on, Charles Babbage laid the groundwork for modern computers in the early 1800s. He designed mechanical calculating machines with four parts, input, data storage, a processor, and output. Babbage's machines never worked, but today's computers have a similar design. Our field reporters have more on this story. Thanks, Annette. We are here at the Computer Museum History Center, where they have assembled some of the most important computers in the last 50 years. I guess you could say this place is kind of like a Computer Hall of Fame. Great, Brahmin. But what's with a toaster? Oh, well, good question. See, this toaster illustrates the four basic parts of the computer. Now, just like a computer at your home, the raw data goes in, the information gets stored, then this raw data gets processed, or in this case, toasted. Bam! The end result. Mmm, it is pretty tasty. But there still is one big difference between the computer and the toaster. That's the processor. See, the computer's microprocessor is so powerful and so versatile, it can do so many more tasks than just this toaster. But the key thing to remember is that both of these machines still have these four basic parts. Let's start with input. When the first general purpose computer was built in 1945, data had to be entered by flipping switches and plugging wires. That computer, by the way, was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, or ENIAC. Can you even imagine having a computer without a keyboard to input data? For years, scientists and engineers, they had to flip levers and twist dials, and they even had to punch holes in cards just to input data. Even with this kitchen computer, people were expected to flip switches to store the recipes. Now, of course, today, input is taken on many different forms, from the click of a mouse to a digital microphone to everything else in between. Rebecca has the second part of the story. Just like Babbage's calculating machine, the second thing a computer has to do is store data, either temporarily while it's being processed or long term so you can access it when you want it again. One kind of storage is read-only memory, or ROM. Now, ROM is programmed into a computer's chips, so it can't be altered or lost. You use ROM each time you boot up your computer. Another kind of storage is RAM, random access memory. Now, RAM is temporary storage. It's constantly being erased and changed. As you type in a story, for example, both the words and the software instructions for your word processing program are stored in RAM. If you shut off the computer without saving your file, your story is gone. Kaput. Fortunately, you won't lose the software because there's another copy of it on a third type of storage. Hard drives and floppy drives. This monster was one of the earliest hard drives. And today, this hard drive can hold a hundred times more information. The processor is what makes the computer work. All data and instructions have to pass through it. The processor takes in raw data, it performs tasks called for by the software, and it communicates with the rest of the computer through the motherboard. The processor does all of this through rows of switches. In fact, the history of the processor is really just a story about switches. Early computers processed information with thousands of switches like these. Vacuum tubes. They were big, bulky, and hot. And the ENIAC had over 18,000 of them. In the late 1950s, the processors used a switch like this. It was a lot smaller and it put out a lot less heat. By the early 1960s, the switches had been shrunk down to this size. As for the computer, well, that's another story. But it wasn't until the 1970s that all the processing functions of a computer could be put onto a single chip. Here's the first microprocessor, the 4004, invented by Intel in 1971 for this calculator. People called it a computer on a chip. Microprocessors could be programmed to perform many different tasks, 
and his computer hobbyists soon realized these processors could be used as the brains of a personal computer. Since the 1970s, microprocessors have been made much smaller and much more powerful. It's really the processors that have driven the computer revolution. But hold on, Brahman. All that processing power doesn't get you anywhere unless people get the results. That brings us to the final part of a computer, output. Output is anything that can be recognized by us or a machine, and it can take a wide range of forms, including sound, video, or in the case of this old classic, print. People dubbed early computers electronic brains as if they were like human brains, but everything a computer does must be processed mathematically. Today, computers can make decisions based on huge amounts of input, but can they really think like humans? Rebecca consulted some experts. Computers have received a lot of attention for their skill in chess, and players regularly practice against computerized programs, so we thought they might have an insight on how a computer's brain is different than a human's. It's different because, yes, a computer is much more constant. It makes better moves than you would think it would. The computers think more moves forward than a human and do look at all the possibilities in a couple of seconds, and we look at all the possibilities in a couple of hours. Do you think a computer has a brain? Um, no, I don't think it has a brain. It just kind of has memory. that It just uses that to... It doesn't really think. Yeah, creativity does count. It, first of all, helps you more with your planning. You can see further ahead and more complicated moves. You can be tired when you play, you have fears, you can be afraid of the opponent you're going to play and that really damages your skill. You can be a lot weaker because of that, but the computer has no idea who it's playing. It's not afraid of anything, it's not tired. That's the story from here, Annette. It looks like computers and human brains still have a few differences. Computers haven't taken on the sinister form that Hollywood directors may have imagined. Instead, they've evolved into powerful tools that can only do what we tell them to do.